talks, we encourage it. Thanks, Liz. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions, we will have a Q&A portion in the latter half of today's presentation. Please enter your questions into the chat box and we will make sure to raise those for you uh, later on. And my next note to self was hit the record button. Liz did that. So I think that means we're ready to rock and roll. So before I totally turn it over to our guest today, I'm going to introduce them. Um, some of you may recognize Dr. Dr Jeff Drobot. Uh, they've prepared some introductions. I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and honor them because they've done a fabulous job of recognizing their many accomplishments. Jeff Drobot is a visionary biological medicine physician, biohacking pioneer, and published author. He's recognized as a leading authority on European biological medicine, electroceutical performance technology, and athletic performance. Dr. Drobot is the founder and co-founder of the Biomed Centers in Scottsdale and New England, collectively the largest and most preeminent biological medicine centers in North America. Additionally, he is founder of Cerebral Fit Brain Training, a nutraceutical, electroceutical company translating the latest research into solutions for peak performance and brain health across a lifespan. Dr. Drobot has spent the last 20 years harnessing the cutting edge science of biological medicine technology to assess and amplify human biology and physiology. He is passionate about guiding people near and far who envision being free from chronic illness and those dedicated to preventing a serious diagnosis from ever manifesting. So Dr. Drobot, I'm not sure how you have free time, but we're honored to have you once again as our guest and sharing your expertise. In addition, he's got along with him today, Dr. Uh, Guy Odishaw. Guy is founder of Bhakti Wellness Center, one of the largest and most diverse integrative medicine clinics in the country. He is co-founder of the first integrative student health clinics in the country at the University of Minnesota. Most recently in collaboration with Dr. Drobot, the co-founder of Cerebral Fit Brain Training, Again, a nutraceutical electroceutical company translating the latest research into solutions for peak performance and brain health. Guys, 30 years of clinical experience specializing in treatment, resistant chronic pain, uh, traumatic brain injury, and psychoemotional trauma informs his approach to brain health. Additionally, his 20 plus years as meditation instructor and facilitator of courses on personal growth help him understand how to support clients through the potent changes arising from neurotherapy. Brain training does not only alleviate its symptoms, it often positively changes one's whole sense of self and relationship to the world around him. In addition, we're glad that uh, Guy will soon be bringing, hopefully, Bhakti Wellness Center on board as one of our Biomed Network providers, and so we will be able to share uh, resources regarding his practice and services available with uh, you all, and we look forward to that. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over. I'm going to share my screen in the presentation. So give me one, one moment as we transition and, and we'll get going. But welcome to you both and thanks again for being here. Absolutely. And maybe I'll, um, maybe I can preface this for the audience. And <clears throat> before a guy kind of goes through the technology, because when we, you know, when we're speaking about this subject, which is, is really brain fitness, you know, we always, everybody joins for a different reason and somebody has Alzheimer's and somebody has dementia and somebody has post-COVID and somebody has Lyme disease. And, and we go through all these things and we say, and in medicine, especially this is a, anything from the head up is, is a dead topic in medicine. You know, we say, uh, good luck, um, do some crossword puzzles and maybe this will resolve. And that just isn't good enough, obviously. And when we talk about you know, what, what can we do for an organ specific training on something that's so important, such as our brain, we're really left with um, not much. And with the advent of technology and, and you'll hear some of the things that we put together, uh, you can see that there is certainly a lot of things that we need to do for brain fitness that didn't exist five years ago. And so as the <clears throat> horrific stats keep coming out, you know, I always just, um, I'm amused because I have a lot of medical colleagues, of course, and you know they always revert to like, there's nothing we can do. And I'm watching my parent, I'm watching a loved one go through this <clears throat> diminishing process of cognitive function, and I'm just kind of a bystander. And that's a hopeless case. And I hope that in this next brief amount of time, we can show you, you know, there is some very good technology that is now coming out that we've kind of put together you know, duct tape together, so to speak. And the results end up being uh, quite fantastic. And I can tell you a personal story. My, uh, my father-in-law had a stroke, uh, had a cerebral incident 
from actually an operation. He was a, um, a former police or a past police officer. And this was just last year. And he had a, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a problem. Um, he had an incident where he was in the hospital and being a physician, I hadn't been on the other side of that. I don't know why I'm getting verklempt here. I just went to a, a Disney cruise with him and I, I hated every second of it. No, I'm just kidding. My wife's probably on this. But it was, he was in the hospital anyways for about a month, you know, non-ambulatory, basically laid out. Wow, guy, I think I'm going to have to hook myself here. But <laughs> I went to Guy's <laughs> clinic, you know, because we had, we had technology. And I said, there has to be uh, a lot to do here. And, you know, the, the results were miraculous when we actually, you know, I had to roll out the, the boot, the, the sleeves and say, you know, how can we do this and, and in what forms can we do it? Because that prognosis was not good. And it was, um, I wish I had pictures of him then and pictures of him now, because the results really are quite amazing. So I'm going to go uh, cry in the bathroom for a little bit, and then I'm going to come back and collect myself, and I'm going to give you a beautiful pageant. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to guys so we can go through some of the, the horror stories and, uh, and then deal with the, uh, the inspiration on the other side. You know, Guy, before, before we totally turn it over, I just, Jeff, uh, thank you. Um, I think that part of the reason we have such incredible amount of registrations for today's event is because, uh, you know, it's, yeah. yeah, we're all hoping to live a nice, healthy, long life and enjoy, you know, the benefits of that, but it's, you got to keep your mind intact and hopefully, you know, your total health intact. So I think it speaks to why a lot of us are here and I appreciate that. All right, guy, I'll, I'm going to stop stepping on your toes now. Don't cry, guy. Just keep it, keep it, keep it together. <laughs> I, I don't know. You've got me, you got me a little teared up. Um, uh, okay. So, so we can probably jump to um, the third slide. So I think the next one um, is, uh, yep, yeah, this one. So um, I don't know, uh, Dr. Drobot, if you want to say just a little something here, or if you need to take a moment, I can. So when we're doing a, when we're doing a total brain program, you know, there's a lot, medication isn't great. And we, you know, that's, that's a hard thing is even in the medical community, we'll say with dementia and Alzheimer's, there's no cure, right? There's a, there's a certain plateau. You can't even stop it. You know, you can't even slow it down. We've become, um, unfortunately, breath with situation of it's going to it's going to just continue in this downward pattern and almost make arrangements and do stuff to take care of your loved ones and you know alzheimer's is probably and dementia are probably the two most expensive things in medicine now because of the care that we have to give people for a continual period of time so when you're putting together a program we always talk about nutraceuticals and supplements because we go from pharmaceuticals to nutraceuticals to electroceuticals and when you're dealing with something like the brain and the nervous system um, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals can only do so much because the brain is an electric organ uh, and it has a big tight skull so we can't do much physical therapy to it so it left us with this whole of how do we treat the brain you know how do we treat an organ system that needs the most treatment because it's our most sought after investment and that led to using physics so when we look at nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals it's biochemistry when we look at Electroceuticals, it's physics. And that's, that's where the exciting thing with brain health uh, ends, up, ends up landing. And as we go through the nutraceutical part, we put together supplements that basically increase uh, blood flow to the brain, which is always good and can do a certain amount. But I think as Guy goes through the next meat of the order, um, you'll see the electroceutical part is what's really important again. You know, this is brain fitness. We have to think about this from 60 on. And, and sometimes, you know, but we keep going reverting back in years because unfortunately the incidence keeps reverting back in years. But we all have treadmills at home, or at least we should. Or we all have some exercise equipment, but we have nothing to exercise our brain on a weekly basis. And I'll just say like, it is a, it is a shame to wait you know, because we all should want to protect this and we should all want to exercise it and we should all want to be able to treat it and to make it the best possible brain we can, but we need to have direct treatment on the central nervous system and brain. And to do that, we need equipment. I agree. 
Okay, so um, I wanted to kind of do kind of a, a little bit of a, a high level and just kind of zoom in slowly to device a set of context. So one of the things we think about um, at Cerebral Fit is this idea of uh, slow stop or reverse. So when we're talking about neurodegenerative conditions, whatever they might be, and that could be again dementia, or it could be macular degeneration, which is basically dementia of the eye, um, we, we have this kind of mantra where we want to slow, stop, or reverse. And we never know in anyone's case um, which of those we're going to get. Um, so this, this is really just a statistic. This is from the um, um, Alzheimer's Research UK group, which are fantastic. I heard maybe we might have some people from the UK on the talk today. So shout out um, to this group. They're doing amazing work. So one of these stats is just by pushing back the timeline of the of the onset of symptomatic dementia, the number of, of people that can be saved from this condition. So we're at you know almost half a million people. And then there's another statistic that that, that includes then a larger group, which is about 300,000 uh, caregivers that won't need to move into the caregiving space if we can push back that timeline. So it just speaks to a, a lot of us, are, I mean, always the thought is cure, cure, cure. And, and what I want to set today is that we can have multiple goals. We can have multiple endpoints. And sure, yes, let's work towards a cure. I love it. But also, let's look at these other strategies around management, you know, prevention, management, uh, minimizing the impact. Like, what would it be like to live with the disease dementia but have no symptoms? Like, is that good enough? And so this helps set that perspective. Go to the next slide. And so this is another one um, that talks about this, makes the same point, which is quality of life score. So these are our surveys that are done at, to look at quality of life. And, and we can see is as the condition advances, quality of life goes down. And, and I'm going to have a little um, quote here uh, in a moment that really illustrates what can happen, again, without being overly concerned about the idea of cure, we can return quality of life, which is of course valuable to the person themselves, but it's also valuable to the family around them. I mean, I can't tell you a, a husband or a wife, a son or a daughter that, that isn't overjoyed when, um, when people improve. So next slide. So here's um, uh, something, a, a text I got from a, a husband speaking about his wife. And this is um, somebody, I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and, and read that. Um, I'll be like Dr. Grobot if I, if I read this, um, uh, who was on the cusp of being institutionalized because of a five-year progression. And so by the time they reached me, they were right at that decision point. And now she is uh, back to living her life. She's golfing, she's going out with friends, she's playing bridge again, she's going to the grandkids hockey games, she's driving, I mean, uh, you know, 80%, 90% of her quality of life is back. And I get texts from him on a somewhat regular basis, sharing moments like this, um, like going on a date with his wife, you know, it's beautiful. So part of the joy of my job is I get texts like this sprinkled throughout my week and I get to hear these amazing stories. Next slide. So this is another point that I wanted to make, which is, Again, we tend to focus on something like dementia or, or a, a, like a unilateral condition. Um, you know, Dr. Grobot mentioned Lyme, we can think about Lyme. But we, it's really important to back up and think about that these are, are um, you know, there's many co comorbidities and how these um, different symptoms create feedback loops within the system that drive the progression of the overall, um, you know, kind of, uh, move into um, loss of function in disease. And so there's a number of points at which we can intervene, but again, might not be about affecting the disease, but it is affecting about the health and function of the person who has that disease. Um, you know, as just an example of, with our macular degeneration people, we can take somebody with, you know, diagnosed disease, um, vision loss, and return them to a point where when they go into their ophthalmologist, they have no diagnosable sign of the disease. But we wouldn't say 
that they don't have macular degeneration, right? They just don't have any symptoms of it, right? So this idea of, of kind of eliminating the disease is a fine idea and I'm all for it, but I think we can expand our, our uh, model of what's possible and, and allow some of these possibilities to come in without it being a binary of I have it or I don't, right? Are you, are you curing it or not? Um, next slide. So this is about, you know, to go a little bit deeper into that, this is the way I think about um, treating uh, most conditions, even if, it's, if, if I'm seeing orthopedic clients, but staying in the kind of chronic degenerative conditions, I, I think about like, what's the primary, um, so disease process, right? So if we're gonna talk about dementia, we might think about it's a protein folding issue. And, and you know, I think we can even, the research now is showing us we could go even deeper, more fundamental, that it's an information processing issue. That's kind of at the core of it. But then we have these higher level things where it's about plaques and tangles and things of that nature, which is, you know, all kind of fine things to say and talk about. But we say like, so that's the etiology of the disease. But there's a number of factors that play into the loss of function, like this uh, lady that I was talking about earlier, who was living a life where pretty much she was in bed and until late into the morning, she'd get up, she'd go downstairs, she'd sit in a chair for the, the bulk of a day and then go back to bed. And that, was, that made up most every day, right? There just wasn't any um, significant functioning there. And we were able to restore most of her function. So, the loss of function can be due to, of course, the disease itself, but then there's the, the sequelae that arise from that disease process. So then you have the, the symptoms of the disease, then those symptoms cause dysregulation, and then you kind of have symptoms arising from the symptoms. We have these layers, right? And so what I look at when I'm forming a treatment plan for somebody is how do we start addressing those layers? And, and again, yes, always in my mind is the disease itself, but it's, it's how can we restore function? That's the primary concern. And then yes, can we address the disease? Sure, that's great to have in the mix. Um, so this is, I just want everybody to keep this in the back of the mind as I go through. Um, these devices cut across this spectrum from merely kind of, kind of regulating dysregulation, so on the level of symptom, but also many of them hold the possibility of addressing the, the disease process itself. Um, and, and, you know, maybe in the Q and A, we do a little distinguishing between what does that mean? So next slide. So this is one of the main questions I get when I do consults with people, this all sounds kind of space age and, and something that I just, you know, came up with, you know, Dr. Grobot and I in the bar the other night just decided we were going to start selling this and, and we just made it up, but indeed, no, um, there is, uh, you know, probably 60 years of research, like just, you know, modern American quality research on the things that I'm going to talk about. So this stuff is not new. It's been in the shadows. It's been eclipsed by sexier forms of medicine. Um, but there's a long and rich history here. And, you know, a person could spend um, really the rest of their life trying to pour through the research to get their arms around it. So yes, there is a plethora of research backing all of this up that we're going to talk about today. Next slide. So um, we're going to jump into the devices and just throw a lot of, of terms, your direction, but again, can sort some of this out in the Q&A. So photobiomodulation, basically putting light into the body and the helmet we use this. So transcranial photobiomodulation, putting head light through the skull and into the brain. The other device you see there is the nasal laser, which is using the nasal passageway to put light into the body. Um, uh, so, and you know, what does it do? It was a, a long list. This is a short list of the benefits, but it's, you know, so neurogenesis is just um, initiating a process of growing new neurons. Synaptogenesis is initiating a process of growing new synapses angiogenesis, growing new vasculature. And right there, if we stop there, if we, again, if we we're just focused on dementia, we've taken on three of the main concerns, which is the loss of neurons, the loss of synaptic connections. And in the case of vascular um, dementia, um, you've got issues with the uh, vascularization in the brain. So, so these are some pretty potent um, 
processes right at the beginning, but then we get into things like um, increasing mitochondrial activity. Mitochondria seen as one of the, the foundation problems in the neurodegenerative diseases that cuts across not just dementia, but you can get into um, Parkinson's and you know, other related um, neurodegenerative conditions. And we see the reduction in the number of mitochondria and the activity of mitochondria. Microglial cells, another, another you know, area of the brain that is, is being seen as having a primary influence in maintaining brain health. In neurodegenerative diseases, something goes wrong. The uh, microglia stop doing what they're supposed to be doing. And then we see this process of degeneration. There are aspects of photobiomodulation that allow us to interact with the microglia and, and communicate with them and, and encourage them to kind of um, reinitiate their um, kind of endogenous function. So a lot to be said in the area of photobiomodulation. Um, next slide. So audiovisual entrainment is one of my favorite devices. This is, to me, this is the low hanging fruit. Everybody should have one. Um, the inventor, Dave Seaver, did a brilliant job combining three modalities into one device and making it affordable. So we've got uh, visual entrainment with the glasses, we have auditory entrainment with the headphones, and then there are ear clips um, that do transcranial stimulation. So we have three potent modalities in one that can be used together individually. But again, we can see we can have a direct impact on what's happening in the brain and, and with the AVE in that it's um, kind of speaking the language of the brain. You know, so we could say the, the brain waves, delta, theta, alpha, beta one, beta two, beta three, gamma, um, that that's the language of the brain. And we can use a device to, in a sense, talk with the brain in its own language and um, you know, course correct it where there's been dysregulation Again, maybe the dysregulation is, is in the disease process or it's being caused by something downstream, some of the side effects, the sequelae of the disease interrupt um, how the brain communicates and we can begin to restore that. Right? So it's a, it's a very potent form of intervention to help the brain return to its natural normal functioning. Uh, next slide, yep. So uh, another device that is, this one is specifically for transcranial stimulation, um, which again is, is a, a powerful you know, influence in the brain. It's very gentle. Um, you know, in a review of some 30,000 studies, there was no significant adverse effects, right? I mean, we wish we could say that about uh, pharmaceuticals, right? But it's just not the case. Here with electroceuticals, we see potent positive effects and no side effects, right? Again, we can look through the literature and it's very hard to find anything that even looks like a meaningful side effects and nothing in the area of a, um, you know, a significant uh, adverse event. Next slide. So here we use um, the Muse S sleep tracker because sleep, very important for the brain. Sleep is one of the things, you know, that goes wobbly in, in many of the conditions that we might have. and so being able to uh, track a person's sleep and really see where their sleep cycle is going um, awry helps us plan a more specific intervention rather than kind of guessing. I mean, we just throw the usual sleep hygiene at somebody, but what I'd rather do is get data. And what I like about the, the Muse over against the other things um, that are out there, Aura, Aura Rings, Fitbits, et cetera, um, this is actually measuring EEG in the brain and bringing us information that is brain-based and not hand-based and, and making extrapolations upon extrapolations upon extrapolations, um, this is going directly to the source. And this device also allows us to do some you know, low level but um, valuable neurofeedback with clients. And one of our commitments in Cerebral Fit is designing at-home training programs, right? So that we can kind of eliminate the the time and space of needing to come to the clinic and do appointments. So that helps on, you know, kind of on the time side and also helps on the money side. So we can reduce costs, make it more efficiently and more integrated into a lifestyle. Next slide. So one of my favorite devices, uh, so this is microcurrent therapy. I think of this as, again, in that kind of, kind of pharmaceutical, electroceutical comparison, this is a pharmacy in a little box, right? It has thousands of frequency pairs that we can do to affect uh, 
thousands of different cellular functions and kind of, uh, you know, encourage the body to move in a particular direction, um, you know, moving back towards uh, kind of endogenous function and back towards health. So we can use this device to treat the brain, um, which we do occasionally. It's, but for us in Cerebral Fit, it's a bit more of this is our body side, right? And, and we really want to think about, you know, the body, like the brain belongs to the domain of the body, right? Unlike where we maybe think about mind and, and we have a different conversation there, you know, brain is a physical organ, belongs to the body. So we really always want to be thinking of the whole, um, you know, the, the whole electrochemical spectrum, uh, regardless of its anatomical location. So frequency specific microcurrents gives us a really strong, um, a flexible system to address uh, the more than the brain side of it. Next slide. So here's just a, an example of one of our um, dementia clients. Uh, this person actually went through uh, our Bredesen program. So we, we look at diet, lifestyle, um, bringing the nutraceuticals, the electroceuticals. This person also went through a full course of neurofeedback. Um, and so this measure is called peak alpha frequency is a very well understood in neurophysiology metric. And it's, it's pretty precise, like a peak alpha frequency should be pretty much 10 Hertz and it should be 10 Hertz everywhere in the brain when we measure it. There's some variations on that, but just to keep it simple, we could say the brain should be firing at 10 Hertz. And the, the one on the left, you can see this is pre-treatment. Um, there's a lot of red and orange, so in, in um, understanding um, uh, uh, electroencephalograph and, and quantitative analysis, what I tell people is uh, color is bad, right? That gray background we see on the right image, that's normal, right? So this brain being compared to an age and gender um, normative database, well, the closer it is to the database, the closer it is that the colors go to that gray, which is no finding, right? So on the left, that's not good. That's three or more standard deviations, ex excess activity. And over about a year, we were able to bring them back to something much, much closer to the normative database. But along with this, we saw just an incredible change in his functioning. This was somebody who was about to lose his company. His board was forcing him out. He was, he was just not uh, capable of functioning. The company was going down. Uh, he came to us in an urgency. Here's what's happening. We got him started. Well, gonna, you know, having to say by six months, the board backed off. He was doing fine, and and now is you know the company is doing better than ever, and he's back to living a normal, healthy, active life. Re renewed his his habits and his athletic activities. So it was a really great story. Next slide. So that takes me to the end of. Um, what I'm going to share today, and we can move into question and answer. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to back us up a little bit, um, both uh, Guy and Dr. Drobot. We appreciate all that uh, information. And I want to recall, Guy, what was the phrase you used at the beginning in thinking about the way we think about cognitive health? I, I want to make sure the, I get that. The, 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 the slow stop uh, reverse. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That's our, that's our, our kind of our mantra. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you, the three of us had had a conversation a little bit ago and, and I want to bring that forward because, um, you know, we, we got into it. We heard a bit about your background and then I, I kind of want to root us a little bit better before we get into Q and A, though I, I of course welcome any questions that have come up talking about the cerebral fit endeavor that you guys have, um, to walk. I, I think for instance, some highlights of that conversation, you guys have jointly come at this together with your varied backgrounds. And part of what you do is you do an intake with patients and you've assembled kind of this handful of really quality cutting edge technology that then you can bring to bear on each of these cases. Is that right? Or how would you say that in your own words? So as complicated as it looks, <clears throat> our core thing is we do photobiomodulation. So you'll put glasses in it. Uh, and I wish we had a picture and, and you'll see the video. Our website is in development, but when you're at home, because people, again, especially for this population of people, if I want to do some training, I mean, I'm all over the world, you need something that you can do at home. You know, there's, um, and with the technology, you can now do this at home. 
So there's base, there's audio vision on trainment, helmets, nasal lasers, and supplements. You know, if we just broke it down to say, how ridiculous can you look in your uh, lounge chair at home? That's, that's basically going to take the cake. But while you're doing that, and when we say training, we have to remember this is, this is cerebral fitness, right? This isn't something I don't, I, I never want to call this medical treatment because I never want somebody to get into the position where they need medical treatment, you know, with the, uh, amount of data we have now and with you know the environment being a little more interesting these days um, the load on that nervous system is big you know and in medicine it's interesting we only kind of identified a glymphatic system which was the drainage system in the brain in the last five years and we said well where, where did this thing exist and when that drainage system becomes blocked we we almost auto intoxicate ourselves you know the self-pollution so i know we had to go through all this technology to show you the you know, the complexity of it, but the simplicity of it is you put your helmet on, you put your glasses on, you put some light up your nose, you push go, and you talk to your brain on a, on a number of different levels. And what does that do? It's akin to exercising a bicep. You know, if we go ahead and we just lift a soup can, it doesn't have to be a dumbbell. If we continually lift soup cans and we talk and we stimulate that organ, namely the bicep, we end up getting a pretty decent bicep in the end. And the technology we're trying to say is endless, but our process is simple. The most simple part of the process though, is that you have to do it. And I know we saw some questions and answers and there's diets and there's, you know, what do I do with this? And what do I do with this? And what you turn it on, you know, you have to turn it on. And when you're doing that the nice thing with technology now is lifestyle's hard. Right. I wish we had a bunch of things that we, you know, had time to do, you know, get rid of this person in your life, add this person in your life, quit your job, and then just go ahead and sleep all the time and eat organic food. But it's still, unfortunately, not going to do what you needed to do at this brain level. You know, you need to have active stimulus of the brain. And so the helmet, the glasses, the nasal laser, that's the key. You know, that's your treadmill. You get on that treadmill multiple times a week and, and you will, you know, you will see wonderful results. Well, and Dr. Drobot, you, we work with a number of athletes, right. in in, in the area of optimization. And I think in that, that same conversation I'm referring to, you talked about how, you know, let's take football, for instance, right. You go into the weight room and you do work those muscles, but in an intense and active and quick sport like that, right. You need something for the brain. So it's my understanding that based on what you're saying in this conversation and that one, there's an element of optimizing and just maintaining and improving brain health over time, preventing that decline. At the same time as Guy, you were talking about some of the people you've worked with, if you, if you have had some cognitive decline due to a variety of different circumstances or you know the effects of different systems in the body, your products can also help uh, in, in that area as well, right? Absolutely. So I, I wanna just, um you know, address, you know, kind of this question, but also um, uh, trail on uh, what Dr. Probot shared. It's, so, you know, you, you, you know, saying like, here's a treadmill and yes, but, but actually these um, it's, it's a little bit more like having like the whole gym right at home, right? Because these, these devices, what I try and do when, I, when we're selecting devices, try and select devices that uh, ha are, are very flexible in what they can do. Right. So as you were asking about the process, you know, we would meet, I would meet with a, with a client, we talk through what's going on, what's their health history. Um, we might do some cognitive assessment online, uh, neuropsych evaluation, if we need to send them to a center to have a, a you know, a, a neuroimaging done, like, like we just talk through all of that and personalize it. Right. And it can be as simple as, you know, oh, I'm, I think I have this problem. I think I have ADHD. Great. Here's our best ADHD. Put it in the mail, send it to them. They, they use it. And then they're right back and say, ah, oh, this is so much better, right? Like it can happen that simply, right? And that does happen. And then we have the other side, which is much more complex where there's much more testing and we're doing blood tests and we're doing neuroimaging. Uh, and we put together a very comprehensive detailed plan for that person. But that's what I like about these, this equipment is to one person, I can just say, put it on, press go, because that's what they need. But another person, I will custom design a, a protocol so that device will do something unique that their brain needs that, that the next hundred people wouldn't need that. Mm -hmm. right? 
And so that to me is, is the brilliance of the, the cerebral fit model is I feel like what, what we are really is a solutions company, right? We hear what a person has going on. We design a customized, personalized treatment plan, and then we deliver that to them. Again, primarily we're advocates for home-based treatment. We go through a series of virtual um, consults to help them get up and running with the equipment and create that at-home treatment plan, which they, they then engage in on a, ideally on a daily basis, right? And I call it the, it's the toothbrush for the brain, right? You just do these things every day for, you know, like with the toothbrush, brush your teeth every day for as long as you want to have teeth. When you're done with your teeth, stop brushing. Same thing for your brain. Use the devices every day till you're done with your brain, then stop using them, right? I mean, it's really kind of that um, kind of simple. So, yeah. I do have a couple questions that were submitted ahead of time, and usually I would ask those first. However, I'm at risk of totally losing the thread here on the questions coming into the chat, which are excellent. So I want to I'm going to flip over and put a uh, just a pin in these other questions that I, I want to be sure to come back to. Um, but in the meantime, Jane had asked whether these devices use Wi-Fi. Um, so, so none of our current devices are Wi-Fi enabled. Um, we right now we're we're like all wired connections. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Amy asked, um, does pulsed magnetic therapy help with brain function? Pulsed magnetic yeah. therapy helps with circulation. And if we increase circulation, we can help with brain function. But um, we always, uh, and again, <clears throat> at our clinics, we have 50 million things, right? To do local treatments on the brain is probably the best way to do it. And <clears throat> to look at pulse electromagnetic field therapy, which again, just as a way to make the body do something, I would say it can, but who wants to put a PMF on their brain? Right? Like we, uh, we have to be just, we already can get into the Frankenstein with enough stuff. Um, I think there's, there's just easier and more effective ways to do it. But of course, I'm a big proponent of PMF and and uh, yeah, I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we we have one PMF device in our lineup. Um, I would say we're still getting better results when we're using current. So we're putting an actual current into the body versus translating that current into a magnetic field and putting that magnetic field into the body. My guess is that that that's where we're likely going to end up but it's really, it's the technology that is, that is the shaky bit right now. So again, we also use PMF here in the clinic. We have some very advanced devices, um, but we, we here in Auckland would never treat just with PMF. We would always doing um, alternating current and photobiomodulation um, because of the specificity of being able to control what happens where, when, why. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Um, Susan asked, are people with arteriovenous malformation at higher risk? Anytime that you have circulatory, so we'll say dementia and Alzheimer's is getting, is getting more towards being called type three diabetes, right? Because as they look at it, they see, you know, the microvasculature ends up being a problem. So people with blood sugar dysregulation, you know, which is, which is no, no real different than the eye. So when we look at the eye, I just call that a, it's, it's basically an, like an extension of the brain. They're, they're little neural organs and, and they're very sensitive to any change in, in circulation. So, you know, does it predispose to, yeah, but you know, there's lots of, we know this from heart attacks, right? We can form collateral circulation. And as long as we have vascular health that we're working on, then a lot of the things that may be a limitation at the start can be treated, you know, or at least can be facilitated so that they become less of an issue. But I know where that, I know where she's going with that. Okay. All right. Um, next question, Dorian asked, um, do, 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 can uh, Huntington's disease, which destroys the brain, be treated with neurofeedback, uh, red and infrared light? So um, in most neurodegenerative conditions, I, I'm, I generally don't recommend neurofeedback. And, and this is getting rather specific, right? And, and I don't know in their asking of that question 
if they're using neurofeedback kind of in a general way or in a specific way, but I'm going to answer from a specific side. So um, what, what we tend to do is more uh, neuromodulation, neurotherapy in the generative conditions to, again, to kind of that slow stop reverse that process. Then within that group, you know, we may select a client in the beginning that looks like a good candidate for neurofeedback, or later uh, we may bring in neurofeedback to begin to rehabilitate uh, the, the, the synapses. But again, neurofeedback is a learning paradigm. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it's its own animal. It's, it's not these other things in terms of what it does. So Huntington's disease is, is a challenging one, um, but yes, it is equally susceptible to these changes to health and vitality that any of the degenerative diseases are, right? When we put more resources into the body, the body tends to use those resources to heal and regenerate. And, and that's, that's really what we're after again. So I would never say we treat Huntington's. We, we add resources to the body and we help the body um, restore its information processing functions. And then what we see often is the, the, the thing we call a disease uh, starts to abate, but, but we were never addressing the disease we were returning function. Okay. I do have a couple other questions regarding conditions. I'm gonna come back to those in a second. As again, I'm down on my groupings of things I'm coming back to. Um, but there were several questions in a row asking about the availability of these. And I know it's something, again, the three of us talked about at one point. So I'd love for you to talk about, and in, in you've included information on how to reach you at Cerebral Fit. So for those of you who think you might wanna reach out, Again, um, that was in the slides and those slides will be posted to our website. So you'd be welcome to reach out. A guy provided his email directly um, at Cerebral Fit. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about the availability of these treatments um, and, and how someone might access them, that would be very helpful. Sure. So again, our primary model is the at-home treatment. So Dr. Robot has a couple of clinics. I have a couple of clinics. But part of where, where we got together was just both of us, after decades of this, realizing the limitation of the clinic, right? Just the people who are in a geographical area can come, but also the expense of it. And what we've, we both realized is we're, this technology is at a place where it doesn't need the limitation of a clinic. So doing it in the clinic, absolutely an option, fine, not not saying don't do it or one shouldn't do it, it has its pros, but what we're really orienting ourselves to and, and trying to, to educate people about is, this is actually goes better at home, right? That say the audiovisual entrainment, you know, you're gonna do better doing that every day than coming to the clinic twice a week to do it, right? It's just a better model, outcomes are better and it's more efficient healthcare and it's more efficient lifestyle. So we really emphasize the at-home side. Mm -hmm. And so again, where it starts with is a consult, decide what, where does a person wanna start, right? Because part of what this process involves is the person, right? Compliance is a huge piece. I just had a, a consult with a client who's got every one of our devices, right? And got all loaded up, got through everything. And that was just like, I surrender. I can't, I can't, like, I'm not willing to do all of this. So, so then it was a, more into a, like, I'm not going to do any of it, but, but then we, you know, we had a little time we're like, okay, let's pick one, let's pick one device and we're going to start there and we're going to layer it in a bit at a time. And, you know, the analogy I use is like, you don't go to the gym on the first day and lift all the weights. Right. And so we want to be mindful of that for people. So again, it's really about understanding the individual, not just the condition or the symptoms they have, but what are their resources? You know, the resources I think of as time, money, energy, and attention, right? And everybody has some limit around their time, money, energy, and attention. And so we just fit a program that matches up with their resources, including their motivation, right? And then away we go. Like I have people who just use the nasal laser, they use it in the car on their commute to work. Like that's all I can get out of them is doing this treatment during that time. Good enough, I'll take it. We can start there 
and, and then add in layers more later if they want to. So in terms of, of availability, all of these devices are available. Um, I would say the, the, the main thing is really putting together that program to understand um, what's, what's the right starting point for any one person. All right. Dr. Robot, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Again, if you go on, I think the person was asking like, where do I go and get this to, right? Like if you go to, <clears throat> our website is still in development, but if you go there and just fill out a contact form and say, hey, I'm interested in, in doing some of this, Again, we will we will find the uh, the shoe that fits, and it does. You know, I would like to believe that in time, you know, because there's a lot of different devices that it'll be push play, and and <laughs> your brain will light up and come on. But there still is like, as Guy said, these are indiv individualized people, and we, uh, depending on the severity and what the goals are, we should probably uh, size it up first. So, go to the website. Fill in the contact form. We'll set you up with a consult. Jeff, this question is to you more specifically. Are these devices at the either of the biomed centers? So we have them in Scottsdale. And again, <clears throat> you know, the, the reason I brought this and, and before I, you know, cried my eyes out, it was, you know, on this fact finding mission because we had a bunch of stuff, but man, was it big. And when we were, you know, when my uh, father-in-law, I mean, we were not in a good situation here. So there had to be something like I said, we got to mobilize this stuff because it was a it was a big family thing to be able to get this person back and forth. And I mean, I own the damn place. Right. So, I mean, I'm not even dealing with scheduling and it's still it's still hard to do. And so we do have them here. But the purpose of linking up and dating guy was like, hey, how do we conceptualize all this so that, you know, the person can be at home? Because as a caregiver, which, you know, my beautiful wife and their family, they they I mean, they, again, you saw, this was three months. And again, in, in medicine, you know, in neurology, this would have been like years. Right now, we ended up decreasing it to months. And even though he probably would never give me permission to show him, to show you the pictures, um, it was nothing short of miraculous. But what I learned in the process was, wow, what an extra stress. You know, what an extra stress of coming to a clinic trying to get this person in a car, trying to get them to be cooperative. And then when we, we you know, when I looked at technology, you realize, eh, why don't we just go to that person? And when, you know, the caregiver, it's always a beautiful thing when the caregiver, it's kind of like you push your kid on the bike and then finally the kid just one day rides the bike. And one day you just see the person. Boop. And I mean, you, then you know, like, hey, we've crossed this threshold where the person has become less as a patient and more of a, you know, an advocate of their own therapy. And so once they get it, uh, they are available at the clinic as a short answer, but only I'm going to say from a testing perspective, this stuff belongs at home. You know, you do this in, in the comfort of your own home because we want you to keep doing it because when you keep doing it, you keep getting results. Got it. And I, you know, I, in, in my haste to get things going this afternoon, for those of you, I, I'm going to make an assumption that we have people on this call who maybe don't know the Marion Institute very well, or uh, who haven't been on BioBytes or maybe coming to us, you know, through a, a different referral system. This is where we can be helpful. So again, I'm seeing through the chat, we've got people with all kinds of different conditions and concerns, and they're asking whether these devices might help them or be beneficial. And I'm guessing those questions can be played out. You know, we've got Lyme on here, post uh, COVID, post concussion, right? These things are very common um, for anyone looking for care. That a call to the to us here at the Marion Institute, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with people like Dr. Drobot at the Biomed Centers, with with Guy, his clinic, with Cerebral Fitness. That's where we can be an asset, right? And that's the benefit of these BioBites is. There's a lot we don't know about health that fortunately you all, you all being Dr. Drobot and, and Guy, know through your, your many years of practice. And we're very fortunate to have you in our network and to have access to you and to be able to connect you with people who are looking for answers and for care. So I just, I wanna make it known that that's something that we can do. You can reach Jessica or I here at the Marion Institute and either us or our colleagues can help connect you with people who might offer more expertise or an ability to refer you appropriately based on your conditions. All right, I'm gonna rapid fire a little bit because I do have people, quite a handful of people who have asked whether this can help with their conditions. I'm gonna ask a longer question and let you take it because then I wanna turn a little bit to the like, 
at what time or what point in our lives do we do this? And practically speaking, how do we take care of our brains so that ultimately, you know, years from now, that whole, you know, the whole aging of the brain goes pretty well. So the so rapid maybe, fire. Maybe, maybe this is what you're planning, but do you want to just like, just name the condition? I'm going to do it. So yes, yeah, someone answer. asked, for instance, about brain cancer. Can any of these help with someone um, who's suffering from brain cancer, battling brain sure. cancer? Yeah. So, um, so cancer is always a tricky one because cancer is our own natural cells, right? That have kind of lost the connection to the collective. They've reverted back to a single cell organism. So everything that our normal body takes as a nutrient, so does mm -hmm. the cancer, right? So we just have to be mindful of that part. So um, there's a company called Novacare, Novacure, Novacure. They're, they've got a microcurrent treatment for brain cancer. It's amazing. It's unlimited release, but there are hospitals um, that are using it. I would definitely say, look at that. That's the direction I would go there. Now, as a supplement, more to the sequelae of cancer treatment, mm -hmm. that's where um, photobiomodulation, the red light therapy, absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I have so many wonderful stories of people adding in light therapy to deal with the side effects of chemo and radiation and all of that. Yes. And to the, to the point, you know, we have a, a, a problem called chemo brain, you know, which is the, you have chemotherapy and then for the next 50 years, you're, you know, you have reduced function in the brain. And, and again, that's photobiomodulation and audiovisual entrainment is absolutely magnificent for that. Yep. Beautiful. All right. Another condition was asked about uh, was uh, long COVID and brain fog associated with that. Yes. Some great new research, again, back to photobiomodulation showing its ability to reduce inflammation, e increase mitochondrial activity. But the main thing is really this very fascinating pathway that the spike protein seems to be leveraging in the brain that causing the dysregulation. For whatever reason, infrared light seems to be able to interrupt that pathway and, and kind of, well, it, it, it's like a prophylactic against the, the dysregulation coming from that interaction. So um, it's our number one now for anybody with post-COVID mm -hmm. is go to photobiomodulation. Um, I would say it replaced our other number one, which was acupuncture and herbs. That's where we were seeing the best results. But now I would say photobiomodulation is right up there. Um, Great. All right. A um, couple more for you. And I'm, I'm conscious that we're coming up on one o'clock. So I'm going to try and keep us moving here. What about post-concussion syndrome or neurological Lyme? Both the, both the same. Again, <clears throat> brain injury is the same as decreased brain function. And again, we, you know, we put all these names in front of something and we forget like it's, it's an actual organ. You know, when we're talking about the brain, we pretend like there's just this, like one is lung cancer and one is pancreatic cancer. And it's like, no, 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 no. It's all, it's all one organ, right? So when we're talking about a brain injury, so concussion being an injury, and we'll say an infection, I would say is inflammation, which can continue to be an injury you treat it the same way, which is optimizing the function. Now we dial it in a little bit different, but at the end of the day, that organ is looking for resources to heal. We have a real hard time sometimes with supplementation in pharmaceuticals because you have a little gate called the blood brain barrier that says, I don't want anything up here. And some guys have snuck by the guards at the gate. And so that's why we use local treatments to go ahead and use on an organ that again, can have a bunch of different names that are wrong with it, but at the end of the day, the, the, the organ just doesn't work like it's supposed to. So yes, football players, beautiful. Um, cheerleaders, beautiful. Soccer players, beautiful. And that's why it's not only for us old fogies, right? Like if you have somebody at home and they're going through um, some issues, again, Guy mentioned ADHD, but even young ones that have you know multiple concussions and then we pull them out of sports, which I just hate, um, there's nothing in medicine that we do, right? Especially it's like, well, they're going to grow out of it. It's like, why, why would we do that? Right? Like, why, why wouldn't we just go ahead and get them out of it and benefit on the other side, which is actually, you know, we're building a better brain and we're, we're allowing flexibility because we know things like concussions are decades processes. We don't want to go ahead. And, I was, guy was like, a, you know, we were, we shouldn't have been, we were having a conversation the other day. And I said, everybody asked me like, what's the diagnostic, right? Cause we in medicine, we're like, what's a diagnostic? And I said, an autopsy. 
right? Like you want to get to the point where you can say, I always knew I had it. And it's like, yeah, that's postmortem, right? We can do autopsies to look at that stuff. But, you know, the technology all exists. Um, and unfortunately, medicine is, is um, not understanding that functionality, increasing functionality is the best way to treat a condition, right? Yeah. All right, which leads me to more or less my last question. You talked about these technologies kind of being able to benefit people at different ages, different circumstances. Preventatively, are they also recommended kind of at you know any mature age? What I mean, what are we talking about? Uh, I mean, we'll have two answers. We'll have mine and we'll have guys. For me, it's if you're in, again, athletically, if you're involved in anything that's a contact sport, and again, I, I'm a proponent of that, right? Play is a big thing that we're missing. If you're, if you're involved in any contact sports with all the information that we know now, um, I would say there's a certain period in adolescence when you're going and doing that, that it's absolutely essential, even twice a week that we do this and we look at this as chiropractic or preventative care. I like that. Guy, I'll let him answer the old phobies question, which is where I'm at in my life, almost 50, and, and when, we, when we should start. So, so yes, I mean, the whole, the, the, the whole range from peak performance to chronic degenerative disease, like Huntington's disease, the whole spectrum. And again, the analogy I use when my clients ask me this question when I'm, uh, is like, when is the right time to start eating uh, healthy? Like, should I start eating healthy at 30 or at 20? Should my six-year-old eat healthy? Like, should I eat one healthy meal a day or should I eat three healthy meals a day? It's like, the, the answer like, is just obvious. We should, like, mom should eat healthy so the baby is eating healthy. And then that baby, as soon as it starts eating its own food, should eat healthy meal every meal of its life for the rest of its life. What we're doing is, is we're providing nutrients to the brain, right? We're giving the brain nutrients that it recognizes and knows how to use. And, and even more than that, and, and this will take us into a whole other podcast, is we're, we're interacting with the information processing system, right? So even to go above physiology, that's where these things really do their work is on the information processing. And, and so again, any age, condition, no condition, we know that we can take somebody who's, you know, kind of neurotypical and improve them with these technologies. Like, the, yes. And, and again, the question would be, well, why, like who doesn't want to be a better version of themselves. All right, I appreciate that answer. Uh, it is one a minute after one, but I have Ooh. one more question for each of you before I allow us to hop off this call because I, there, I think there are even questions I didn't quite get to and I apologize for that if that- I'm gonna question. interrupt you for one second. Yes. Are you able to capture these questions um, and, and, and like, like, can you just do like a copy paste and put those in an email to me and I will answer them and get them to you. Beautiful. I will, what I'll do is I get a copy of the transcript when we close this out and I will grab those few that we didn't get to and I will get those to you guys and I appreciate that. And then we have everyone who's on here by name, their registration information and I can reach back to you with the information you provided. All right, but here's my question because I wanna focus on moving away from the technology for a second. In terms of lifestyle, and I want from each of you, what are the top three things you would recommend someone to do or eat or whatever to improve and maintain brain health over a lifetime? Guy, I'll go to you first. Sure. Uh, a ketogenic diet. So, yep, keep more ketones. Absolutely, this part of keto, ketogenic diet, no sugar. And, and that's not just like sugar, like opening up the sugar bowl and eating it, but you got to look at every food, right? Fruits, vegetables, how much sugar do they have in them? Sugar's got to go. Number one, absolutely that ketogenic diet. And then um, uh, exercise, right? Just get some exercise, walk, whatever, keep it simple, um, that. And then I'm going to say one, one piece that's a bit specific to the neurodegenerative crowd is probably for those people, like the first thing is diet, fix the diet. Second, most important thing in terms of activity is get out and explore novel space. Go someplace you've not been before, go to a museum, go on an open house tour. It, it is the combination of moving the body through novel space that lights up more of the brain than going for the walk in the park that you always go in or doing the Sudoku. 
Sudoku is right next to useless, not Sudoku, not anything, but because the brain's an efficiency engine, everything that you do like that, it learns how to do it better and better and better every day with fewer neurons. What we need is novelty, right? So this is going, navigating the world three-dimensionally in novel spaces, lights up the most brain, recruits the most neurons, and absolutely. So diet and novelty. Beautiful. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Drobot. Sleep. You know, that's, it's, uh, you know, the, the problem is, is uh, tech, which I love, right? I love this thing, but this is doing nothing. This is a nervous system upon a nervous system. This is an old machine. This is a new machine. New machines are always louder than old machines because old machines are wiser. They know how to do things. We will not make this thing wiser or quiet, more quiet for a long period of time. Um, and then going along with this thing, you know, there's a lot like fun, you know, and I always say this and people always are like, what do you mean by fun? And I say, if you have to ask me about that, then we have a big, you know, we have a problem. And then the third one would be detoxification, you know, which is a hard thing, which is a whole nother concept, which again, maybe 20 years ago, I didn't have to do, but if you ever want to like have some horrific information, just go look at the glymphatic system and understand that the glymphatic system, which is this pump, right? It's pumping stuff out that we're all getting exposed to. And again, if you want to have another horror story, go do it. It's an easy test now. It's a urine test to look at environmental toxicity, what you've been exposed to, just what you're being exposed to in a day. And then you can work backwards and try to go live in the cave somewhere and try to eliminate all these chemicals, but it's impossible. But the long story short, the only time your brain drains is at night when you're in a deep sleep like that's the only time and this interrupts it and this interrupts it and so when we're talking about like brain hygiene unfortunately we have to do this detoxification process because our bodies are a closed system and it's transporting this oil up to the brain and so sleep the glymphatic system operates from like 1 to 3 a.m and it's a pump that pumps all that crap out but only if you're in a sleep now, the good thing is technology can make you uh, <laughs> can sleep, change yeah, sleep. that a great, little bit. But you have to sometimes sleep. use tech to undo tech. That's okay. <laughs> Perfect. All right. It's like you guys, it's as though I paid you to answer these ways, but I didn't, I swear. Um, a few notes. So next month, we've got Amy Thurber, who wrote a cookbook, um, What Do You Eat? She'll be joining us to talk about eliminating food allergies or cooking to support the body rather than fight it. Um, we've got a lot of people out there today who have different intolerances. Uh, in, let's see, January, though, we'll have one of Dr. Drobot's colleagues, Dixon Tom, on um, talking about his nature's laws to live by, right? And he's talking about all these things we just talked about, which is putting the right stuff in your body, having fun, getting yeah. to sleep. And then followed by, we're hoping, our new friend, Rick Clarice of Sound Mind Systems, or Clear Mind Systems, excuse me, who specializes in sleep talking all about how to improve your sleep. So you guys just teed us up for months. It's great. And then also not to overcommit my colleague, Jess, but I do believe she's talked about offering our 21 day challenge in January of this year. So if you would love to just be inspired to be reminded of these lifestyle habits and to get some tips and resources to support you to make some positive changes uh, in your daily life, uh, you'll want to make sure to keep informed of what's going on here at the MI and Jess is, is your, your gal. Uh, we'd love to have y'all join us for that, that um, program in January. So thank you both Guy and Dr. Drobot. We're always pleased to have your company and your wisdom shared with us. If any of you on this call today would like to be in touch with them, again, please use us as a resource. We'd love to help connect the dots and support you in your wellness and in your health journey. Uh, thank you again. Great program. Bye guys. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye now.